All right, so uh, moving on into the second half of the Helena, which is Faust Part 2, Act 3. Um, in dealing with these two halves, the first half being classical and the second half having to do with the, the north, the Gothic north, um, we should always recall uh, back in the beginning of Faust Part 1 when Faust had said that two souls, uh, alas, dwell within my breast. And those two souls are, of course, uh, for Goethe anyway, that of classical civilization, Greco-Roman civilization, and that of the civilization of which he was a part, uh, the Gothic North. Um, but as a matter of fact, there are, of course, three civilizations. Um, there's the Christian civilization as well, which is Judeo-Christian-Islamic, which Spengler terms in Decline of the West Magian. There has been in the West a dual pseudomorphosis on the one hand, from the Magian civilization and on the other from the classical Greco-Roman. The Faustian civilization that lies underneath them, uh, which has its origins in both Celtic myth on the one hand and also Scandinavian myth on the other, um, is a different civilization with a different world feeling, a Faustian world feeling for the grasp of infinite space <clears throat> and the unfolding of all things uh, through time infinitely, infinite space and infinite time. Uh, but here, uh, Goethe is going back, and he trained, he's trying to suture these two souls as he sees them, classical versus Nordic, uh, trying to suture them together. And so in the second half, um, we are now, this is a painting uh, by an obscure 19th century German romantic painter, a perfect image of one of these kinds of castles of the knights in the north that now uh, Mephistopheles has spirited Helen and her chorus of Trojan women off to, to, there to meet Faust as their liege lord. Faust is in the role of a kind of uh, knight from this time. And um, so they go in there, and the chorus is there looking around at all this opulence within the, <clears throat> within the castle. And then Faust approaches with uh, a bound man at his side and asks Helena uh, to decide his penalty because he's, he's the watchman, Lincius. He's the watchman, and he was supposed to be watching... Uh, but he was derelict in his duty because Menelaus and his army is approaching. They're not, of course, but um, it's, it's part of the illusion that Mephistopheles has concocted for Helena and the, uh, the Trojan women. And then uh, she says, uh, she grants clemency to Lincius. Um, and then now, now Helen now is then cast in the role. Once she gets back into the sort of Gothic North, um, she is cast into the role now of one of these women who, in the period of the troubadours and in, uh, in France uh, and in the north in Germany, uh, the Minnesangers, as they were called, uh, where they had all this chivalry, which was based on, in a certain sense, the worship of women. And um, this extends from about 1180 all the way down to Dante in 1300, um, although the, the, the cycle itself, which extends from the court of Eleanor of Aquitaine um, in, in France, for, it goes from 1180 to 1210, uh, but Dante in 1300, um, his sort of uh, entire divine comedy is a sort of peon to Beatrice. So it still has a dying, a last dying echo with Dante's celebration of Beatrice. And so Lincius, uh, so Helen and her now is put on a throne. And so notice that Faust approaches Helen in a much more circumspect and respectful way now. He has to woo her now. He, uh, whereas the last time he saw her when... They, uh, Faust came from the realm of the mothers with her shade and Paris and during the, the show in front of the emperor he had shoved Paris aside and tried to embrace Helena and the whole thing exploded on him <clears throat> here he has to do it in, uh, by, by, courtly, by the rules of courtly chivalry uh, which is to say traditionally you would uh, write poems to the beauty of a woman uh, and she would tell you you have to go and do this for me and do that for me these little deeds to prove that you really love me uh, and that you don't just want to have sex. And so um, Alencius then um, flips into this mo the mode of a menacinger here uh, when he puts her um, on a throne and he says, uh, sort of on behalf of Faust, he says, uh, um, We thrust ahead, we stormed apace as masters entered place on place, and where one day I harshly vexed, another robbed and stole the next. We looked, no sooner looked than seized. One snatched a girl, his fancy pleased. The next a steer of stolid gait, and all the horses shared its fate. 
Um, but I was fond of seeking out the rarest ever seen about, and if another matched my prize, it turned to sawdust in my eyes. On treasure traces, I would, t I would tread and said my searching gaze ahead. For me, no pocket was too dark, transparent, every cask and arc, and mounds of gold became my own, more splendid still, much precious stone. But now the emerald counts alone, if green upon your breast it shone. Let quiver now twixt ear and lips, the oval drop from ocean deeps. The ruby, though, is put to flight. The blooming cheek will ble bleach it quite. So he's comparing all the, this treasure that they have found on their campaigns to different parts of Helen's body, which is something that goes all, all the way back into the Old Testament with uh, David. Um, let quiver now, let's see. Uh, and so the most prodigious hoard here at your footstool, be it stored in homage at your feet be laid, the spoils with blood of battles uh, paid and so forth. And uh, so that's that's what you do. These are the rules of uh, the chivalric world. So on the one hand, Goethe is sort of upholding the ancient medieval modern, uh, the shift from the classical world to the medieval, medieval world here uh, in the Helena. And then uh, Helen then becomes, uh, as she's talking with Faust, in a, a, a very delightfully written scene that goes back and forth between them, where she discovers that the North has invented rhyme um, and uh, especially, uh, so, and she says, I wish to speak with you, to, to Faust, but first ascend to join me at my side. So come up here, she's sitting on a pedestal, which was what you did uh, as a troubadour or a minnesinger. You put the woman on a pedestal. Um, she says, come up here with me. The vacant place calls for the master and ensures my own. Faust says, be pleased, exalted queen, to entertain my faithful kneeling homage first. This hand, which to your side would raise me, let me kiss it. Confirm me as co-regent of your realm, uncognizant of borders, and procure yourself adorer, server, warder, all in one. She says, Manifold wonders do I see and hear. Amazement strikes me. I have much to ask. Yet I, I desire instruction why that man's converse rang strange to me, both strange and pleasing. Each sound seems to accommodate the other. And as one word repairs unto the ear, there comes another to caress the first. Faust says, Already pleased then with our nation's parlance, you will be surely ravished by their song, which satisfies the ear and sense profoundly. But we had safest practice it at once. Exchange of speech allures it, calls it forth. Helena, tell then, how can I speak with such fair art, Faust? It's easy. It must well up from the heart. So now they start rhyming. Uh, and when the breast with longing over buoys, one looks about and asks, she says, who shares our joys? Uh, trying to rhyme with the, the translator here, trying to rhyme joys with buoys, but <clears throat> close enough. Uh, Faust now seeks the mind no forth or back from this. Alone the present moment, she says, is our bliss. Fa it's a little bit like uh, characters in an opera going sing singing back and forth. And, and indeed, we're going to, uh, Goethe has an idea here that he wants to set uh, the birth of euphoria into opera. Faust says, uh, is hoard high prize possession earnest? And whence comes its confirmation? She says, from my hand. And the chorus of Trojan women who are still hanging around steps in. They sing a little song. Um, and then uh, Mephistopheles, still in the role of the old crone woman, uh, Forsyas, uh, steps in uh, and interrupts their love, as he did before between Faust and Gretchen when they were uh, in the garden. And Faust says, Un Uncouth disturbance, and insolently it intrudes. In hazards even I dislike insensate vehemence. And so the reason that uh, Forsyas Mephistopheles interrupts them is, is to announce that Menel Menelaus is coming. Um, and it's sort of like, you know, the sort of tr medieval tropes, Tristan, think of Gottfried, Gottfried von Strasbourg's uh, about the year 1200 or so, uh, Tristan and Isolde. Uh, and it's as though the scene with Faust and Helen sort of repeats them. They, they would meet out in these love grottos in nature. Uh, there to have sex, um, as and um, King Mark is approaching. So, uh, who is the one that uh, is being cuckolded? And uh, so that kind of motif is going on here. And then Faust said, uh, gives this. Uh, let's talk now, where it shifts from eros to war. And you'll note that in the entire epic, all the way, it, there's always this shifting from eros to war, from eros to war. Um, and here. Faust says, no, heroes muster, you shall savor. Ringed in assembly here at length, for none deserves the lady's favor, but who can guard them with most strength? And he says to the commanders of his armies, 
Uh, incessant in your silent raging, sure warrant of the foeman's doom, you blossom of the north unaging, and you the orient's pith and bloom. And so as he talks here, um, Goethe wants you to think, number one, of the Dorians invading Mycenae. Uh, they come in around just after the Trojan War, around the year 1200, and overtake and destroy the palaces at, at Pylos. Um, they have some uh, going to Crete, um, and it inaugurates a dark age, the, the Greek dark age from about 1200 to 800, uh, down to the time of Homer, where there's no writing. Uh, but also uh, the Volker Vanderung in the north with the Vikings from 750 to 1050, who were uh, storming everywhere along the coasts, and they went into the Mediterranean, all the way up into the Black Sea, up the rivers into Russia. They, they were going everywhere. But then also he wants you to think of the Crusaders, especially during the 13th century uh, in the Fourth Crusade, where they had proclaimed a crusade against Byzantium. Shameful, absolutely shameful. And uh, marched their way through the Peloponnese. <clears throat> And he says, in steel and case, the glare with flashes, the band that shattered realms and states, they tread the earth, it quakes with crashes, and in their wake reverberates. At Pylos we secured our landing. Hoary Nestor is no more. All petty royal troops disbanding the boundless host sweep all before. And forthwith, from the, va the fastness yonder, thrust Menelaus back to sea. There let the vagrant lurk and plunder. Such was his bend and destiny. As dukes I am to hail you captains, thus Lacedaemon's Lacedaemon's uh, queen ordains, bring hills and dales for her acceptance, and yours shall be the empire's gains, and so forth. And then, okay, so then Faust shifts into a different mode, and he says, we, we really shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be um, cooped up in a castle like this. We should be out in Arcadia, which is a realm, here's an image of Arcadia, uh, which is a realm that evokes, of course, pastoral poetry, which begins with Virgil's eclogues, uh, and it's a realm along which the river Eurotas flows uh, north of Sparta that connects Arcadia with Sparta. And it is along this riverbank that supposedly Helen hatched from her egg after uh, Leda and the Swan had their conjunctio. Um, and then, uh, then she hatches from her egg, kind of analogous to, as we have seen, Aphrodite uh, being born on the ocean from, on her half shell. Um, a similar kind of thing. And so he says, we, we really should repair to this kind of a beautiful world. We don't belong here in this castle. So let's go to Arcadia. And he says, when to Eurota's uh, uh, reedy whispers, she broke in radiance from the shell, referring to Helen hatching from her egg. Her noble mother's twin-born sister's eyesight out stabbing by her spell. The twin-born sister is Clytemnestra. Clytemnestra represents discord because... Um, when Agamemnon returns, he finds that she's been fucking this this uh, palace guy, and the both of them plot to murder him in his bathtub, whereas Helen represents accord, um, or, or uh, also discord with, with the Trojan War, and then the, the, the brothers, uh, Castor and Pollux, represent accord. And so then he says, This land, all else for your forsaking, presents the finest of its worth. Then all the globe, yours for the taking, prefer, O oh, choose the native earth. Though on its ridge the jagged peak must suffer the solar arrow with a frigid glare, the boulders have a blush of green to offer, the goat collects a toothsome frugal share. The torrent tumbles, fed by countless rillets. Already gorgeous rises, alps are green on meadows, stippled with a hundred hillocks, sedately spreading woolly flocks are seen. And so on as he goes through this Arcadian sort of uh, hymn that sort of refers back to Virgil's eclogues, especially the fourth eclogue which is referred to here when he says, one watches the enchanting child. Now the child points forward to Euphorion, the, the child of Helena and Faust. Um, but it also links back to the child that Virgil announced, uh, and Virgil was contemporary with Augustus, uh, that Virgil announced in the fourth eclogue, saying that a new child is born now, and this child will inaugurate a golden age. He'll put an end to the Iron Age that he had, had said we were stuck in, going all the way back to 650 B.C. or so with Hesiod in the uh, Theogony. And then he says, no, this child now will inaugurate a golden age, and he'll bring back a new Saturn and a new Troy and all of this. And Christians then, when they got a hold of the fourth eclogue, uh, thought that it, w it referred to the birth of, of the, the Christ child inaugurating a new golden age. But then here, so Goethe refers back to that when he says, one watches the enchanting child attaining down flawless days to father's vigor then 
and stands amazed, the question still remaining if these are gods or mortal men. Uh, so was Apollo shaped to shepherd likeness, that of their fairest one resembled him, where nature works within her own pure cycle, all worlds link up without an interim. Uh, and so then they move to the Arcadian scene, and then uh, Mephistopheles, still in the guise of Forsyas, comes in uh, and finds all the Trojan women chorus asleep, and he wakes them up and he tells them uh, the, the tale of the birth of Euphorion. And this is a very important uh, scene here. The, the birth of Euphorion, and he describes it um, as follows. He says, um, Yes, uh, secluded from the world, but me alone they summoned for discreet attendance. Uh, let's move a little forward here where he starts telling about the birth of Euphorion. Uh, so then Helen and Faust have been in this Arcadian scene for a while. They've had sex and uh, out springs Euphorion. So he says, um, so they do, you callow children, talking to the, the Trojan women chorus. Those are recesses unfathomed, hall on hall, and court on courtyard, although he's talking about the nature here of Arcadia. Uh, these I pensively explored. All at once a peal of laughter echoes through the hollow spaces. And this is Euphorian now, who, who bounces out. Uh, and there's an image of a painting um, of Euphorian. And Euphorian is based on an actual Greek mythical character um, in which Achilles was said after his death, his shade uh, comes up and brings Helen's shade up from the underworld onto the island of Lucy, where uh, they mate and produce the child Euphorion, who is born with wings. Um, Jupiter falls in love with him, um, and he has wings, and he tries to fly, but Jupiter casts him, casts him down. Uh, so he never has a successful flight. He's kind of like a later version of Icarus, uh, to whom Goethe refers here. And Goethe thinks of Euphorion, number one, as prefigured in the boy charioteer at the carnival that we saw at the beginning of part two in uh, the Holy Roman Empire there at the emperor's uh, court, where the boy charioteer uh, was burnt up in flames and represents the spirit, the incarnation of the spirit of poetry. This is what Goethe tells Eckermann, who interviews him, like uh, an early version, let's say, of, of Bill Moyers interviewing Joseph Campbell. Ackermann interviewed him and then published the interviews after, shortly after Goethe, Goethe died. And he says, no, Euphorion is the spirit of poetry. And he based it, scholars say, on this painting here by the Baroque uh, artist Annabale Caracci, uh, who shows Euphorion flying upwards. And, um, and so we note this bouncy quality to him. The moment that Mephistopheles is talking about him being born, he's just bouncing around. Uh, As I watch, a boy is tumbling from our lady's lap to master's. From the father to the mother, tender frolic, fond caresses, teasing loves, inane endearments, playful shouts and gay exulting variously strike my ear. Naked genius unfledged, a fawn exempt of faunic coarseness. He will leap on solid ground, which like a springboard countervailing, flings him upward high and higher, till by second, third rebounding, he has touched the lofty vault. And I think that's, this is the painting Goethe is referring to here. He wants to fly, but can't. And in, in Goethe's version, he doesn't have wings. So he wants to fly. Um, this is poetry uh, straining for the absolute, straining for the vault of heavens. And then he says, anxiously, his mother calls him, leap and spring as fancy takes thee, but forbear to fly. Untrammeled flight is not vouchsafed to thee. Thus the honest father warns him, in the earth and here's resilience, this is Faust uh, telling this to Euphorian, uh, which will buoy thee up, if only thou adhere to it on tiptoe, like the son of earth Antaeus, it will strengthen thee at once. So, like Antaeus, he tells him, Antaeus was the giant who drew his strength from contact with the earth. Um, as long as you keep your feet on the earth, even if it's just tiptoe, he tells his son here, um, it'll, it'll strengthen you. You don't fly, you'll lose contact with the earth. And then um, further down, Mephistopheles says, uh, uh, in his hand, he has the golden lyre. So he just pops out with this golden lyre from these rocks, exactly like a little Phoebus. And then so um, so he pops out with a lyre, which represents the spirit of poetry. And then the chorus comes in, and they sing about um, Hermes. 
uh, Hermes as, as a young, as a sort of boy wonder, or, or wonder child is the archetype. Both Euphorion and uh, Hermes are presented as the archetype of the wonder child, which is, as I have said elsewhere, the West's primary archetype and the reason why Helen is the soul of classical civilization and Faust is the soul of Nordic civilization together produce the same archetype, Euphorion, because both civilizations have inaugurated this archetype. Both of them share it. Um, and so it, the Greeks are really the first to bring in this archetype of the wonder child who refers to the future and hence to the West turning away from the cults of the dead and the ancestors. Uh, no filial piety for the West. The China remained and Mesoamerica remained in. Uh, the West has turned away from that toward technological innovation. Um, and so it may go all the way back to these cycladic figurines. Here we have the prototype uh, of a character here that's been called like the prototype of Orpheus, but it's more like the prototype of Hermes who invents the lyre from a tortoise shell. And we think back to the classical Valpurgis Nacht where he transformed the nymph Coloni in, into a tortoise uh, and the Tritons and Nereids went to get her shell in order to bring the Kabiri. So he invents the lyre and he gives it to Apollo which gives then Apollo the that's why he becomes the the, uh, the patron of poets, him and the nine muses. Uh, and here might be uh, the earliest archetype circa 2500 BC from these little cycladic sculptures that are so elegant and very Greek-like. Um, this, this may be his prototype but most certainly in, in the art of Crete um, from about the same time, um, 2500 BC, there are no old men represented in Cretan art, and none of the men have beards. None of them. In contrast to the Mycenaeans to the north on the Peloponnesus, who, who do have beards, um, they don't. And so it looks to me as though the Cretans are the first uh, to invent the archetype of the wonder child here, which uh, both the Greeks even though I see Prometheus as their primary inflection and Faust as the North's inflection, nonetheless the two are genealogically ancestrally related to the central archetype of the Wonder Child, which is why we always look to our children as our future saviors. So-and-so is going to grow up to be president. So-and-so is going to grow up to be Steve Jobs and provide us all with jobs and uh, income and money and technological innovations and all these things. Uh, this ridiculous Spielbergian myth that, that the child is going to save us. Um, that's where this originates, and that's the archetype that Goethe is dealing with here in the Helena, with Euphorion. Even though, as far as Goethe consciously was concerned, Euphorion represents the spirit of poetry, but in terms of collective cultural processes of the collective unconscious, that's not the case. That's only a surface structure. Euphorion is the archetype of the wonder child who overreaches his grasp. And so after the course sings about Hermes and all of his deeds, and then it comes back, and then Goethe inserts this libretto for what he was hoping would be a kind of a, a, a miniature opera. He, he had tried to write a sequel to Mozart's Magic Flute, um, and, which he loved, and so he wrote this, hoping someday somebody would come up with a little opera to go with it. That never happened, and so it's Euphorian, Helena, and Faust and the chorus of Trojan women, all going back and forth, back and forth, as he bounces around uh, and talks, moves from love to war, yet again, from Eros to Thanatos. And uh, they keep warning him not to try and fly. Uh, he really has a spirit of levity, not gravity. He wants to get the hell out of here. And he keeps bouncing around, jumping, and finally they can't restrain him, and he just jumps off a cliff and plunges to his death. And so note there, too, that uh, like uh, the child that is produced by Gretchen and Faust, who is doomed, so too the child that is produced by Faust and Helena is doomed um, in both cases. And so, uh, and then there's a little uh, elegy here for Byron, who had died in 1824, relatively young, th 36, I think, in the Greek War for Independence uh, against the Turks, who I think, as far as I can gather, was the only English romantic poet that Goethe read and, and liked. And so there's a little elegy for, for Byron. So he sees Euphorian as kind of representing Byron, uh, who had died in 1824. Uh, and then um, the scene ends up then with uh, him calling out to his mother, Mother, join me. He says, uh, Mother, in this dim realm, let me not dwell alone. 
So she has to go down back to Hades, back to Persephone, uh, as do the chorus women. They have to return as well, except that they don't. What happens is an interesting thing at the end of the scene. They actually disintegrate and dissolve into um, different kinds of nymphs that are associated with different nature powers. First with dryads, and so uh, the chorus disintegrates into four groups. Notice that. It's a quaternio of four. So it's a Jungian mandala that, that this whole scene ends with. Starting first significantly with the dryads, the, the first chorus, um, they say, We within these myriad branches, whispery quiver, breezy floating, lure and dally softly tempting, up the rootwork founts of living to the twigs, and now with foliage, now with blossom all abundant, we adorn the fluttering ringlets, free to prosper in the air, falls the fruit at once foregather, lustily both flock and people, for the grasping, for the tasting, briskly striding, keenly pressing, uh, bowing one and all about us before the earliest gods. Uh, it was dryads back in the um, <clears throat> classical Valpurgis knot that had directed Mephistopheles' attention toward the cave in which the three Gryi were, uh, the, the ugly women who share one eye and one tooth, and in which he went in and became a fourth, namely uh, Forsias. Um, supposedly the name of their father, but then Goethe has him change sexes, so it's, it's an old crone. Uh, but then they become four, uh, after the dryads point him the way to the cave. And then so uh, the second group, of course, becomes oryads, which are mountain nymphs. So we move from the temporal tree to the eternal stone of the mountain. And then the third part transforms into naiads, which are water nymphs. So we move from uh, tree nymphs to mountain nymphs to water nymphs. And then finally into vines. In other words, uh, Bacchus, Dionysus, and the cult of the vine and wine. I think we have one last image here of, uh, yes, uh, the cult of Dionysus, the grape wine. And there's a whole long scene, or a whole long uh, speech here that the fourth part of the course gives where they disintegrate. And so the Apollonian consciousness disintegrates into the collective. The Apollonian consciousness as Nietzsche puts it in The Birth of Tragedy in 1872, is the Principium Individuationis, the principle of individuation, he, uh, representing the individual character on the stage of Aeschylus first, and then Sophocles, whereas the chorus represents the collective ground, the Dionysian ground, the ground of dissolution into the collective, the individual into the group. And so that's what happens here, is that the chorus dissolves into the Dionysian ground of being, uh, on their way out here. And so uh, this is the way the Helena ends with uh, a final paragraph about Mephistopheles shedding his guise as Forsyas and transforming into uh, a gigantic being that we'll see at the beginning of uh, Act 4 here.